So good afternoon from Nigeria. My name is Samuel Drosharo, and I work with the Department of Animal Breeding and Genetics, Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokota, Ogun State in Nigeria. And my area of interest is behavioral genetics, and I work on welfare and behavior of turkeys, Meleagris galopavo, and chickens, gallows gallows. So I work on fair behavior, aggression, uh, oral related behavior, comfort behavior, sleeping behavior, and a lot of other behaviors. And of recent, I developed interest in chicken and turkey vocalization. So we are trying to do some work on uh, vocalizations of chickens and turkeys and get them published. You are all welcome to Animal Welfare Group Nigeria with the acronym AWGN. So most times we call it AWGN, but the full meaning is Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. And this group was founded in 2019 after a gathering of students and lecturers at the Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta Ogun State in Nigeria. And we have three missions. The first mission is to increase awareness about animal welfare and behavior in Nigeria, Africa, and the world at large. The second mission is to foster collaboration and networking among people, researchers who are working on animal behavior and welfare. And the third mission is to educate the public on the importance of animal welfare. We meet first and third Wednesdays of every month to discuss issues that are related to animal welfare and behavior. And people from different parts of the world have presented on issues that are related to ethical practices, slaughtering, fear behavior, stress, cognition, neuroscience, actual practices, one welfare, open science, big data, positive welfare, and others in animals. And when I say animal, I mean livestock, companion animals, wildlife, and fish, not just only livestock. And we are also trying to bring in people that specialize on insect behavior. So soon, we are going to be having people that will be presenting on insect behavior. So this presentation will be the ninth, number nine, in the virtual inaugural lecture series. We have had scientists like Temple Grandin, uh, Mark Rutas, uh, a lot of people have presented on this group. And uh, Pat Jensen will be number ninth person that will be presenting. And um, Pagency is from uh, Linköping University in Sweden, and he will be talking on behavior and welfare in chickens, the importance of early experiences. Today's moderator is Dr. Ulua Sheung Yaseri from the Department of Animal Physiology, Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta, Ogun State in Nigeria. So I would love to hand over to you, Dr. Yaseri, to continue with the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and thank you everybody for joining us. My sincere appreciation goes to our inaugural lecturer for accepting you know, to do this with us. You're highly welcome to our midst. So like he said, I, I'll be the moderator for today's program. And before I go on, I'll just let us know that please, if you have any questions for our presenter, kindly drop it in the chat box and we'll take the questions immediately after his presentation. And please also note that at the end of the Q&A session, we, have, we'll, we usually have uh, like five to 10 minutes for further discussion or if you have any comments to give to the presenter. So please note that and don't leave us. And also the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria is on a different social media platform, uh, the Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. And we have a YouTube channel where we do upload our, our programs. So please check it out and um, make use of them. So without wasting uh, much time, I would like to introduce our inaugural speaker for today. He's uh, in person of Professor Pa Jensen. Uh, pa Jensen is Professor of Ethology at Linkoping University, and he's the scientific head of the Avian Behavioral Genomics and Physiology Group. He was the editor-in-chief of Applied Animal Behavior Science for over 20 years and has published more than 200 peer-reviewed papers and a number of books and book chapters. 
both in English and Swedish. His Google Scholar profile I checked, the H index is 675 with over 18,000 plus citations, which is massive. He has received the ISA Creativity Award and the U4 uh, Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Animal Welfare Science. Uh, the, the research of Pargensin has focused on chickens and dogs and the genetic and epigenetic underpinnings of behavior in relation to domestication and stress in different life phases. Most recently, Pargensin has started to investigate the neurobiological uh, underpinnings of behavior in chickens with a particular focus on the role of the cerebellum in regulating stress coping and social behavior. So aside to research, Je Pargensin is a passionate dog owner, a fascinated chicken keeper, and a devoted fiddler and bagpipe player. So you're welcome, Pargensin, to our midst, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you so much, Olawison. Um, yes, and thank you for inviting me to this. I'm afraid I won't be playing uh, my bagpipes to you today. Uh, that will be for another meeting. So I will just uh, share my screen um, with you. And uh, as you already uh, heard from the introduction, this is the topic of today. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, start out in a very general matter because I'm I, I'm not totally um, uh, up to date on everyone's background in this seminar. I'm I'm really impressed by the wide uh, audience from all over the world. And I'm sure uh, at least the first parts of this talk is gonna be familiar stuff to most of you, but I just wanted to bring everyone up to fundamentals when, the, when it comes to, to chickens and, and, and their behavior and welfare. So just by starting out with some fundamental facts of chickens. Uh, so chickens are, are part of this um, uh, family called Fasianidae, and it contains, of course, all the different uh, species that we are familiar with, like the, the quails, the, uh, the peacocks, uh, uh, the forest the chickens, and so on. And the animal that we are most interested in is found down here at the bottom of this phylogenetic tree. That's the Gallus gallus, uh, which is uh, none less than the red jungle fowl. So the red jungle fowl is the ancestor of, of um, our domesticated chickens and the present day uh, distribution of that is caught in, 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 this, uh, in this map. So essentially Southeastern Asia, that's where we find these animals wild living uh, as of today. Uh, however, there is, um, uh, th th there is a high degree of introgression from domesticated chickens that are kept on countryside in most of these countries. So in all honesty, there are not very many uh, absolutely pure red jungle fowl left out in the world. Um, but I just want to give you all an impression on what this, what kind of bird this is. So this is a male red jungle fowl. And um, what we see from uh, uh, just this small moving slide here is um, the fact that this is a highly sexually di dimorphic species. The male is brightly colored. Uh, he has this beautiful plumage with large tail feathers. And he has this relatively unusual aspect of, of the chicken biology, which are the large ornaments like the comb and the, and the wattles. And I think uh, in the end, I can show you just a few glimpses here of the female, just to emphasize the sexual dimorphism of the species. So this is the female cryptic colored, very small ornaments and um, just above half the size of the male red jungle fowl. Uh, so chickens were domesticated about 8,000 years ago, and uh, the origin of domestication was here in Southeast Asia, like uh, Southern China, Indus Valley, and so on. And from here, the animals were um, distributed with the help of people on um, the human migrations into the Far East, into Africa, and later on up to the northern parts of the world, like Europe, Scandinavia, and so on. So it's a relatively late um, 
uh, con uh, contribution to the domesticated fauna. So this, uh, what we know today from a lot of genetic studies is that uh, the red jungle fowl is the sole ancestor of all chickens, possibly with some introgression at some early stage during domestication from, from other um, close relatives uh, in the jungle fowl family. But, but basically, the, this is the ancestor. And as you can see, these animals actually look pretty much like a modern chicken. Um, and you might even think that uh, if, if you think about uh, all the variation that has been brought about during domestication of dogs, for example, think of this high variety of different breeds and so on, you might, if you're not into the field, you might kind of imagine that uh, chickens are pretty boring in this respect. But I can tell you that this is uh, not the case because we have a huge variety of uh, chicken breeds around the world that vary in coloration, in, in, uh, um, in, in plumage, feather plumage, um, in size, and, and so on. Perhaps not to the extent that of the variation that we find in dog breeds, but definitely large variation. Uh, so these breeds are uh, today mainly maintained as hobby breeds uh, in um, most parts of, of, of the world. Uh, but um, uh, there, there are, just like when it comes to dogs, there are international breed clubs and so on that uh, do what they can to maintain these different breeds pure and, and uh, keep track of them in different ways. And uh, roughly around 400 different breeds of chickens are recognized by these organizations as of today. And of course, there are all these um, uh, exhibitions and so on, like, just like dog exhibitions where you can um, uh, enter your chickens and have them, um, have them judged by, by skilled judges and so on. Uh, yeah, so there is this huge variation. But this is, of course, in bright contrast to what we find in uh, commercial uh, chicken production, because here the variation is really not very big. As I uh, assume that um, uh, most of you are aware of today, when we say chickens in relation to um, uh, production, animal production, food production, we actually talk about two completely different types of animals. So we have, uh, during the last 60-ish uh, years, uh, we've had a split of the uh, production breeds into those that um, are specifically bred for fast growth and that produce chicken meat, and the other group that is specifically bred for egg production. <clears throat> and in both these lines of birds, there is very little genetic variation, very little of these breed variations. As a matter of fact, uh, broilers of the world, up to about 99% of all broilers in the world, are supplied by two companies, the Cobb and the Ross birds. Um, and uh, there are a couple of more variants in the, leg, uh, in the egg laying strain, but uh, still very few companies that totally dominate the world market and uh, very limited uh, variability. And this is, of course, a huge enterprise. I mean, the sheer numbers that we, that, uh, we talk about here are uh, almost uh, impossible to actually um, uh, imagine what, what what it means, but here here are at least a couple of numbers to um, remind everyone about uh, uh, what what an enormously uh, big enterprise chicken production is. So sixty billion chickens slaughtered each year for meat meat production. Five billion hens uh, are uh, uh, every year used for for uh, producing the eggs that we are consuming. So what we can say about this is that uh, if, uh, so this is of course by far the, uh, not only the most um, numerous uh, farm animal species on the planet, it's also actually the most numerous bird that we have on this planet. It also means at the same time that if there is anything in the way in which we 
uh, and breed, rear, house these animals, if there's anything that, that causes welfare problems, this is going to affect a huge amount of animals. And even if it's only a relatively small percentage of animals that will have severe welfare problems, it's going to be a large number of individuals that are affected. So that brings me on to um, uh, uh, just a, a few words of what we know about the uh, natural behavior and the, the biology and the needs of, of this species. So the first thing that I just want to, to, to remind everyone about uh, uh, is the fact that this is a very social species. And as a matter of fact, um, being social in the way that chickens are is not particularly common uh, among uh, birds. In fact, chickens can be characterized as uh, one of very few truly social species. And when I say truly social, I, I mean the following. So of course, there are many bird species that are social in the sense that they, have, for example, breed in colonies that they roost in colonies in large groups during nights, uh, and that they gather in groups during parts of the day or parts of the year. But these, these groups, these um, um, uh, roosts and, and colonies, they are temporary associations where the animals do not have specific relationships to all the other animals in the group. When we talk about chickens, things are completely different. So red jungle fowl, the ancestors, in the wild, they spend their entire life in a family group, which is very stable. So it's uh, it's rare to leave the group and it's very rare for newcomers to join the group. In fact, the way in which you join um, uh, uh, a natural flock of red jungle fowl is basically by being hatched into the group, which means that it's a family, it's a family group. And this of course, is one reason for why chickens have an extremely elaborate uh, uh, communication system with uh, a great variety of vocalizations, body language, and so on. And also why we have um, uh, many different kinds of social relationships where the hierarchy is, of course, well known to everyone, but also things like friendship and social networks within this group that can be stable over, over long times. So the other um, important thing I just want to mention about chickens it has to do with their um, uh, with, with their uh, feeding behavior because chickens are true omnivores. They essentially eat anything uh, uh, that is uh, that contains protein. So whereas maybe the bulk of their food will consist of um, uh, uh, various uh, parts of vegetation, grass, leaves, seeds, and so on. They have a, a fair amount of insects, larvae, and other things that also go into the food. And they do not say no to a small rodent if they can happen to kill a rodent or the young of, of, of mice or something like that. So this is a true omnivore. And one particular aspect of omnivores and their behavior is that the way in which you make a living if you are an omnivore is by being constantly uh, out looking for food. And this is the, uh, of course, the, 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 the archetypical food searching of, of chickens, right, with the scratching behavior and uh, using the very sensitive beak, which contains a lot of touch receptors and so on, to find edible things just uh, under the ground, uh, seeds, insects, uh, and so on. So this um, uh, this aspect of the uh, natural behavior of chickens, of course, puts uh, a lot of um, uh, emphasis on the needs of, uh, of the species as well. Because if you're an omnivore, you're equipped with an instinct to continuously using your, uh, basically all of your awake time in pursuit of food, you might end up in various types of welfare problems if you cannot exhibit this type of behavior. For example, if you're kept in an environment where food is offered in a very concentrated and um, uh, 
short time available uh, uh, manner. And um, the last sort of general issue I want to raise about chickens is, uh, of course, like any bird species, they have a um, uh, very strong instinct to care for the plumage. This is life essential for chickens. And one important aspect of this is the dust bathing behavior. So when chickens uh, roam freely, they will, uh, on a daily basis, they will find dust bathing sites such as this, where they will go through these, um, uh, this ritual of sequence of movements that will allow them to basically clean out the plumage from old fat and parasites by means of, of showering it with, with sand and soil, like this. And of course, this instinct is so strong that if, if they are not given the opportunity to do this, for example, if they are kept in a cage on a wire floor, they will frequently attempt to go through these motions just on the, on the wire floor. So um, uh, the basic needs of chickens can, in fact, be just be boiled down to uh, um, a few bullet points such as this. So based on the natural behavior, we know that if, if we want to fulfill the primary needs of chickens, they need things like perches to sit on in the night. They need nests to lay their eggs in so they can lay the eggs in a hidden place. They need dust base for their plumage uh, cleaning. They need to be in a social stable groups and they need to have a possibility for foraging. So that's all fine, I think. And um, uh, in spite of these 8,000 years of uh, domestication that we have uh, exposed our the original red jungle fowl to, actually these fundamental needs have not changed at all. So many things have changed uh, when it comes to temperament, fearfulness and so on but the fundamental aspect of chicken behavior and needs they are primarily the same in a modern broiler or laying hen as they are in the red jungle fowl but we have indeed uh, changed these animals a lot uh, over the years uh, uh, by selective breeding and most of this has been done in less than 100 years. So this is just an example of how we have increased the egg production from a typical egg laying chicken. Um, the growth pattern of an, a, a typical meat producing chicken uh, from today is dramatic, of course. This is a picture comparing uh, the, 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 the appearance of a typical broiler from 1957 with one from 2005 at the age of 56 days. And um, this little um, short uh, movie uh, demonstrates the, the radical difference in growth pattern. So what we see here is uh, to the right is a broiler chicken and to the left the red jungle fowl chicken uh, day by day. Um, how their growth uh, can be compared. Personally, I think that these are pretty dramatic uh, footage and we are up here at uh, day 35, which is, uh, at least here in Europe, the normal slaughter uh, time for, um, for a broiler. And at this point, the broiler will weigh um, around two kilos, whereas the red jungle fowl will weigh around 200 grams. So that tells you something about the uh, uh, excess of of um, uh, growth that breeding has been bringing about. So this selective breeding that we have done, which is focusing on things like growth and egg production, uh, has also uh, come along with um, several wealth types of, of welfare problems. Some of them uh, are, are related to this uh, breeding. Some of it is related to the way in which we house, keep, rear and breed our animals. So uh, what's illustrated here to the left is uh, feather pecking, um, one of the most uh, uh, dramatic behavioral disorders that we find in laying hens and lameness in broilers, uh, which is um, a big problem because uh, of course in uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, this, this skeleton of the broilers is uh, 
mainly made up of cartilage at the day at the age of 35 days but the body weight that is meant to to carry is um, causing a big strain on joints and, and and feet and legs and so on okay so um but i want to talk uh, um, for the rest of this uh, talk uh, about one particular aspect of um, uh, uh, the welfare of chickens that uh, me and my group have explored over uh, many years now. And that has to do with the importance of uh, early experiences, various early experiences, mainly negative early experiences, but I will also mention some uh, aspects of the positive early experiences. Uh, and one of the reasons why this is uh, really important in farm animals is as this uh, slide tells us that uh, we know that early life stress has a very large impact uh, in particular on farm animals for a number of reasons. And one important reason is that um, uh, these animals simply don't live for so long. So the early stage of life contains a, a rather big percentage of their total life time. So uh, just looking at uh, different species, these small diagrams uh, show uh, the red of these uh, circles uh, show uh, the, the actual life that you can expect if you are a modern farm animal compared to the natural life expectancy of the species. And if we look at the chicken up here to the right, we can see that uh, uh, this is uh, really a very, very small fraction of the lives that uh, these animals can expect um, compared to what they could have lived if they were uh, allowed to live until they would basically uh, reach their, their, their normal aging. Um, yes, so early life is important for these animals. So in, another uh, really important aspect of why early experiences is important has to do with the development of the nervous system. So the brain is, of course, not... Um, ready at the time of birth or hatch, as in fact, uh, the brain uh, continues to grow and develop uh, for quite a while. Um, and uh, this diagram just outlines what it looks like in humans, where the brain grows uh, quite substantially during the first few years of life. And this is for chickens that we see to the right. Uh, the solid line that we have in this diagram shows the development of body mass in a domesticated white leghorn laying hen compared to the red jungle fowl, which is the, the red line here. And the dotted line outlines the, uh, the growth of the brain during the same period. And what you can see from, from this graph also is uh, that, the, of course, the brain is growing uh, or, uh, quite some time. It's slowing down after 10, 12 weeks of age, but it's still growing uh, as long as the body is growing. Uh, the brain is somewhat larger in the domesticated white leghorn compared to the jungle fowl. But if we compare the brain size to the body size, we can also see that uh, the domesticated leghorn, just like, just like all uh, domesticated animals, actually have a reduced relative brain size, so brain size relative to body size. Uh, but that's only one aspect of brain development, because there's a lot of things that happen uh, as the uh, brain grows and develops. And the important part from a behavioral perspective is, of course, how the brain is wired, how the brain is, is programmed. And uh, a lot of development in this respect happens during the early phases of, of life, during, during the uh, 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 immediately after birth and up to sexual maturity. So we have axonal dendritic growth, we have synaptic stabilization, we have a lot of development of synapses, and uh, that, that's really what makes behavior, behavior, cognition, welfare is all depending on um, uh, synaptic connections between neurons in the brain. And this develops a lot during the early parts of life. Um, so this means that if the animal is exposed to negative experiences, stress 
of different kinds during the critical early life period, we will have an impact or there is a risk that we have an impact on brain function, which can actually be long lasting or even permanent. So whereas in an adult brain, um, uh, stress experiences can be transient because the adult brain already has its wiring uh, in the in uh, with stress that is experienced early in life can uh, actually cause a complete rewiring of of uh, of the brain that uh, may affect the animal over a long period, maybe over the entire lifetime. So this is stuff that we have been looking at in my research group now for um, um, some years, and. Um, just to uh, bring you closer to our way of thinking, you can basically divide the early life of any animal into different periods. And this is one way of doing it into three periods. So we have the prenatal period, which we are not so concerned with. We have done some stuff on that. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, and we have the early postnatal period, which is just after uh, being born and hatching. This is where we have a rapid development of the brain and its um, uh, wiring. And then later on, we have the adolescence period, which comes uh, just before sexual maturity. So at a very late, late stage of infancy. And I will show you some data from some of the research that we have done on this. So uh, one experiment that I will start out with talking about is one where we expose chickens to stress at different time periods uh, after birth, after hatch. In this case, we chose to, um, to um, uh, uh, apply this stress, uh, this stress treatments uh, when the chickens were two weeks or eight weeks or 17 weeks, where the two weeks is the, the early postnatal period. The eight weeks is somewhere in the middle uh, towards the end of the early postnatal period. And um, uh, at, at 17 weeks when the animals are just before they enter sexual maturity. And the kind of stress that we use is not very dramatic. Uh, as you will see on this picture, what we are talking about here is um, a, a small battery of stressors that the chickens are exposed to. First of all, we have physical restraint up to the left. The chick is still is uh, placed in the bag and kept there for uh, some 20 minutes or so, or social isolation for a brief period of 10 to 20 minutes. We just put the chicks in a, in a small box. Or we use food frustration. So the chicks are offered mealworms, which they essentially love in little petri dishes. And once they have learned uh, that they can uh, eat them, we, um, um, let's see if I can get this thing to move. We, we present them to, um, uh, the, uh, uh, to the same mealworms in Petri dishes, which they cannot access because there is a lid on top of it. So this is food frustration stress that we see here. And you can see that the chickens are really keen on getting these mealworms. And they try to pick up them, but um, of course they cannot access them. So this battery of stressors is applied at these three different um, uh, ages. And uh, what we have done then is to look at the consequences of this from a lot of different perspectives. And I'll just show you um, a couple of things here, which I think are really interesting. First of all, this uh, graph shows the weight gain during the week of life when we apply this particular stress. And we have the, the grayish bars that are um, uh, the stressed animals and the black bars that are controls. And as you can see, the animals that are exposed to this stress, they have a reduced weight development. But this only applies during the young period, when they are two weeks and when they are eight weeks old. At 17 weeks, uh, there is really no significant difference in in the growth uh, during this period. So this indicates that there is a particular sensitivity to this stress at this early stage. We then looked at the consequences of this for their ability to cope with stress later in life. So this graph shows um, the uh, 
corticosterone reaction. So the HPA axis reaction of uh, the chickens when they are adults, in this case, when they are uh, 25 weeks of age. At 25 weeks of age, we basically take the chicken, we take a blood sample, we place them in a physical restraint bag for um, uh, 10 minutes, take a new blood sample, release them and take a new blood sample again at 30 minutes. And then we measure the corticosterone levels. And what you can see here is that those chicks that had previously been exposed to the stress when they were eight weeks old, that's the ones that have the dramatic increase in corticosterone reactivity. Not so much at the other ages. So this again indicates that there is something special about the eight weeks, which is the late, the late uh, uh, postnatal period for the chicken that makes them uh, particularly sensitive for having a long-term modification of their stress coping abilities. Now, another aspect which is really interesting is that then, uh, in the next phase of this experiment, we, um, we allow these chickens to breed and we had a second generation of chickens and uh, we looked at the, at the offspring and these offspring were never stressed at all. They were all kept under calm and, and nice conditions. And then we did a similar um, uh, stress challenge by having a, a physical restraint measuring the corticosterone reactivity. And of course, it's lower than in the parents, but there is a statistical uh, significant effect of how their parents had been treated. And again, this dotted line here is the offspring of the chickens that had been stressed when they were eight, when they, when they were eight week old. So their parents had been stressed when the parents were eight weeks old. And this meant that the offspring uh, one generation later, had a, um, a, a, an increased HPA reactivity. So this does not only affect animals over their lifetime, but in fact can uh, affect them over generations into the next generation. Um, so this is one aspect that we have been looking in at. So over the last couple of years here, we have been more interested in... Um, uh, a, a phenomenon that is uh, where, um, uh, uh, every laying hen chick in the world is essentially exposed to, and that's what happens at um, the commercial hatcheries. And what we see here is the interior of one of the hatcheries that we work together with, how the animals are basically sorted. What we saw just was sex sorting because the males are disposed of. This is vaccination. And, um, and these chicks have just come out of the hatcher when they are uh, going through this entire processing in the hatchery, which I think uh, most people would uh, actually subscribe to the impression that they, this must be a, a pretty stressful experience to the chicks. So this is something which, which they are exposed to during the hours after they are taken out of the incubators. And after being loaded in the in these baskets that you see here on this picture. On top of this, they are loaded onto a lorry and then they are transported out to breeding farms. And this transport on the, on the lorry can last for up to 24 hours and sometimes even more actually. Um, so what we did in, uh, to, uh, uh, in uh, this experiment was first we wanted to see whether or not this uh, really is a physiological stressful procedure. So we took blood samples of chickens immediately after they had been uh, removed from the incubator and before they had even gone into this uh, processing of, of uh, conveyor bands and so on. Uh, and what we could, uh, and we compare this with chicks of exactly the same breed and from the same batch and so on, which were hatched under calm conditions in just a small silent incubator. And we could see that e immediately after hatch, there is a significant increase of uh, plasma corticosterone uh, in the chicks that come out of the incubators. We then did exactly the same thing after the processing that you just saw on this little uh, video. And we can see that there is an even higher difference in corticosterone uh, activity in in these birds. So um, 
uh, a high stress physiological stress response to this treatment. And uh, after transport, as a matter of fact, the, the, the difference seems to disappear. So the transport is probably not the most stressful of, of, of these procedures, but, um, but the procedure in the hatchery uh, is a very stressful experience to the, to the chicks. So we looked at um, chickens that have been exposed to this, uh, uh, either to, to this hatchery procedure or to be an, uh, uh, being hatched under calm conditions. That's our control, control lines. And at different ages, when they were one week old and when they were five weeks old, we did a physical restraint challenge to these birds. And we looked at how sensitive are they to a stress challenge several weeks after they have been exposed to this initial stress. And what we see here is significant increases in corticosterone, also five weeks after they had been exposed to this. So this is something which um, does seem to affect the birds for quite a long time, uh, uh, actually even up to adulthood. We uh, scored the feather condition of the chickens that come from the hatchery and from these control conditions when they were about 20 weeks old. And as you can see, the, uh, both in females and males, those birds that have gone through the hatchery procedures are, uh, ha have a significantly poorer feather condition, condition, probably due to feather pecking. So, all this sort of points towards um, this initial um, uh, stressful experience as being something that is really affecting the birds for a, for a long time. Uh, and um, the question is, can, can we also measure how they perceive their lives, how they perceive their situation after having been exposed to this? So we turn to um, uh, an, uh, um, um, Another way of measuring uh, behavior and welfare in chickens and in animals uh, by and large, and this is by uh, using uh, this cognitive judgment bias uh, paradigm. So uh, cognitive judgment bias is the, uh, the fact that when, uh, this also goes for humans, when people or animals uh, perceive their lives as not being very good in some for some kind of reason, uh, they tend to judge anything, any kind of stimuli in a negative way. So this is the, the, the famous uh, half full, half empty analogy. So by, by, look, by, by trying and see if, if the chickens uh, will interpret perfectly neutral, ambiguous stimuli as either positive or negative, we can uh, uh, hopefully get at how they perceive their uh, their lives. So the standard way of doing these cognitive judgment bias tests would be to train chickens, as you see on the picture here, to associate, for example, white color with some food, black color with uh, no food, no reward. Uh, and once they learned that, you present them with a gray color. So uh, something right in between an ambiguous stimulus. And you measure whether they actually think that this is um, uh, something which uh, may contain food or whether they interpret negatively as no, this is probably not going to contain food. Now, the problem with this is, with this type of test, is that it takes a lot of time to train the animals and um, uh, put them uh, in a situation where you can finally test them. So there is a limitation as to how many animals you can actually handle in experiments like this. So we decided to go for another approach and rely on the innate um, uh, the innate behavior of chickens, the innate uh, uh, tendency to interpret certain stimuli as either attractive or aversive. And the way this experiment is done is outlined in this uh, in this little picture here. So we have chickens uh, in in a companion box here, and the chick to be tested is put uh, next to this in a start box. And a very strong motivation in small chicks is to rejoin with their social companions. So this little chick has a high motivation to move down this alley in order to uh, regain social contact over here. However, in doing so, it has to pass 
a stimulus. And sometimes this stimulus can be very attractive, like just a mirror. Most chicks think that a moving uh, picture of, another, of a chick is, is highly attractive or something which they innately judge as very aversive. In this uh, uh, case, it's a, it's a picture of a predator, in this case, an owl, uh, which they will tend to avoid. Uh, and then we expose them to intermediates of this. So this is just a picture of a chicken, and this is a morphed picture uh, where we have used a computer program to morph something that is sort of in between a chicken and an owl. And then we can measure how quickly will they uh, 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 pass the stimulus, what's their latency to regain social contact with these different stimuli. And this is essentially what we find. So we have um, the hatchery chickens um, uh, uh, is the, the line with the chicks in this little house here. And this is the, the, the latencies to uh, uh, pass this stimulus. And as you can see for the mirror, they are uh, very keen to um, uh, rejoin social contact if they just have to pass the mirror. So they like the mirror. Um, if you look at the owl, we see a big difference here and also with the intermediate pictures. So this all in all tells us that uh, this experience of early stress at the hatchery has made the chicks more likely to interpret uh, these potentially aversive stimuli as negative, which is uh, what is often referred to as um, a pessimistic state of mind. Uh, when we retest them at 10 weeks of age, we see exactly the same tendency. Um, so again, the, the hatchery chicks are much more reluctant to approach the uh, ambiguous intermediate stimuli again showing a long-lasting uh, pessimistic mindset of these chicks. So of course we have uh, also looked at uh, some aspects of uh, production uh, traits which may possibly be affected by this uh, early stress treatment and these are two examples where we have seen uh, uh, the egg looked at the egg production and this is the number of eggs that are produced. And what we can see here is that the onset of laying is a little bit faster in the control chicks, or if you like to say it the other way around, the onset of egg laying is uh, delayed in the hatchery chicks. They eventually catch up, but the onset is delayed. And also, if you look at the egg weight, um, the hatchery stress chicks actually have a slightly but significantly lower egg weight. So these are things that should raise concern, I think, to um, uh, people who are working with, with egg production and just taking for granted that uh, the chicks will overcome this early stress. As a matter of fact, it seems like it affects a lot of different, both welfare and production aspects uh, throughout life. So I mentioned initially that um, uh, early experiences are important. And so far, I've just been talking about the negative early experiences, the stress. But of course, you might think of positive early experiences as well from, uh, from uh, chickens. And one of the uh, possibly strongest positive experiences that we know of in young animals is um, uh, play, play behavior. And we can look at different aspects of, of play in chickens. And uh, right now we have a research program running where we try to investigate play behavior in chickens from different perspectives, like the form function and also the possible effects on, on welfare. And you might think possibly that um, uh, chickens don't play. At least I've heard many people that are slightly surprised when you say that chicks play. As a matter of fact, they do play and they, they uh, show all the different types of, of play that, we, uh, that have been described in other species as well. Um, this is an example of locomotor rotational play, as it's called. And the dark ones here are red jungle fowl. The light ones that we saw in the previous slide uh, um, are uh, uh, chicks from egg laying hens. Um, 
We have object play where you will see, if you look carefully, you will see that one chick picks up an object from the ground. It runs around, another chick comes up and steals the object. And then it's being followed by the others uh, who attempt to, to uh, pull it out of its beak. And, uh, uh, and this is how it goes on. Uh, here you see exactly the same thing in uh, the red jungle fowl chicks where one chick just picked up an object and immediately this attracts the interest of the other chicks that will follow and try to join in this little play. This is not unlike what you can see in, in dog pups. Um, and finally, uh, we have social play, which is the third major category of play behavior in animals and social play in chickens is uh, pretty much like in any other species. This mock fighting, uh, running around a bit and, and uh, jumping up and performing uh, fragments of the behavior which uh, we associate with aggressive behavior in, in adults. Okay, so how common is this actually and how is this affected by various uh, uh, factors? So the first thing that we looked at was how is this affected by domestication? So we compared the uh, play behavior in uh, red jungle fowl and in the locum uh, and in the um, uh, egg laying white leghorns, and as you can see on the top graph here, there is um, a, a, a huge increase in total play behavior when you in the leghorns in the domesticated birds compared to the red jungle fowl. Uh, this is almost completely uh, explained by object play, which is much increased in, in the white leghorns. Whereas locomotor rotational play and social play is actually uh, somewhat more common in the red jungle fowl. So we can uh, conclude that um, domestication has definitely affected uh, this behavior. So, um, what we figured was that maybe we can use play behavior, so the positive experiences of play behavior uh, to buffer some of the stress that chickens are exposed to in the commercial hatcheries. So uh, we have just finished this uh, uh, first preliminary experiment. So what I'm gonna show you are just preliminary unpublished data now to see if we can, if we can uh, stimulate chicks to play more and whether this can somehow improve their long-term welfare. Uh, so the first thing we did was we we uh, we had chicks from the commercial hatchery and uh, from control uh, environments, and we allowed these uh, birds to play in special playground arenas a couple of times every week, thirty minutes per 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 exposure, two to three times a week over a period of five weeks. And then we had a control group that was not allowed to play in the same way. And we looked at the consequences of this. And um, these are data that we are still working on, as I said, but one of the tests that we did was an, uh, a novel object test. And that's uh, this is after this period of five weeks when they have been allowed to, to play uh, on a regular basis. After that, we run them through a novel object test, which means placing them in a novel environment. In this novel environment, we place a novel object, and then we measure uh, whether or not they will uh, uh, approach this object and interact with it. And what we see in this graph is a, 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 a great increase in interactions with the novel object, something which is normally interpreted as a sign of reduced fearfulness, reduced stress in, in, in this particular context. We also looked at um, uh, this, the HPA reactivity of these birds after the period when they had been playing for five weeks. So we did the same type of um, restraint test that I have uh, explained previously. Um, and what we see is a somewhat increased reactivity in the uh, uh, um, uh, let's see here, we, uh, sorry, this one is has been mis uh, mislabeled. There, um, uh, the, the reactivity in in fact is a bit higher in the play birds, um, but this is not significant. 
So we were not able in this pilot experiment to actually affect the HPA reactivity, but uh, I still think that this is going to be um, uh, an interesting way forward to try to promote early positive experience and thereby buffer uh, possible negative things from stress, such as hatchery stress. So just to conclude, um, uh, final uh, part of the talk now, uh, yes, we know that chickens are social animals with specific needs, and we know that uh, anim uh, the, the stress that they do experience during the early parts of their life can have lifelong effects, even transgenerational. But we think that early positive experiences potentially can be a way forward to buffer such early stress. And with that, um, and a, a picture of my group, uh, which is unfortunately um, a couple of years old now, so some of these people have left the group and others have joined, uh, but it shows um, uh, that we are a lot of people working on this and I did not uh, collect all these data myself. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'd be more than happy to um, take any questions or discussions at this point. No, thank you so much for <laughs> this interesting topic and um... There's a whole lot to learn from your presentation. Thank you so much, Bajen Singh. Uh, to the audience, please drop your questions in the chat box so that we can take it. Uh, while I while I await the questions in the chat box, I think I can you know start up with some questions that I have here. Actually, I was surprised in the last uh, present uh, result you showed that the white leg on actually did a higher, uh, in terms of total play, was higher in the white leg under the red jungle fly. I mm. was expecting it to be the other way around. Um, uh, well, as a matter of fact, no. Uh, our expectations were exactly what we saw here, because one of the defining features of domestication, which is often included as part of the so-called domestication syndrome, uh, which is this suite of traits that are uh, um, shared among uh, many different uh, domesticated animals. One of these traits is um, uh, uh, what we call neoteny or pedomorphy, which means basically a more juvenile type of behavior in the domesticated animals. So we were actually expecting more play in the chickens. Uh, you can see the same if you, for example, compare wolves and dogs, where dogs will be much more inclined to play and also during a longer time of their life. So uh, keep playing up in adulthood compared to their ancestors, the wolves. So th this was pretty much what we expected, actually. Um, thank you so much. I think we have a question now in the chat box from Samal Durusharo. What are the methods that can be used to prevent stress to newly hatched chicks in the hatchery? Oh, that's a good question. To be quite honest, I don't have a good answer to that because I think that the main problem is that Commercial hatcheries, at least as we have them here in Europe today, they are simply totally out of uh, biological boundaries. Uh, in Sweden, we have two commercial hatcheries in total, and uh, each of these hatch hundreds of thousands of chicks every week. So on this large scale, um, on this large scale level, it's very difficult to see how you can do very much to actually change the situation. I would say what we need to do is to go to small scale slow, um, hatcheries or even um, something that has been that is being developed at the moment and that might uh, uh, improve things quite a bit is what we call on farm hatching. This has been implemented uh, to a larger extent in broilers. Uh, and it basically means that you bring in uh, the the eggs into the stable in which the animals are going to be reared and you hatch the eggs in that stable. That works fine for broilers because broilers are not, not sex sorted, but um, for laying hens it's uh, much more difficult because they need to be sex sorted since the males are discarded, which is another welfare problem in its own right, which I didn't even touch upon, that we literally kill millions of uh, uh, laying hen chicks uh, uh, every year uh, 
just immediately after hatch just because they have the wrong sex. But if, there is other work going on with in ovo sexing of chickens. And if we can come up with a good, robust, useful method of sexing the eggs at an early stage and get rid of the male eggs already before they hatch, I think on-farm hatching is something which might improve things quite a bit. But at present, in the in the long run, um, uh, in, in in the large scale hatcheries that we have at present, I have difficult to see that we can do very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for that answer. There is also another question from Samuel Durusharo. He's asking, uh, how easy can we differentiate between social play and aggression in chicks? Oh, that's a really good question. I was hoping for that because um, that that's that's a question that actually pertains to all kinds of of uh, play behavior, and that's one of the pertinent problems in uh, in play. Any studies of play behavior is to distinguish what is play and what is serious. And the way in which we deal with that is by operationalizing the concept. So we have criteria for when, uh, widely accepted actually, criteria for what constitutes play. And one of the most important parts of this criteria is that it's fragmented. I think that, that that's probably the best answer to the question at this point. And fragmented in this case means that when the animals start performing their aggressive behavior, they use basically the same motion patterns as they do in real aggression, but they will interrupt it very quickly. So they will not pertain this aggression. They will interrupt it and immediately switch to something else. And if you, uh, I, you may have been able to see that on the movies I showed you that they would sort of jump up at each other and do this frontal display and pecking, but then immediately they will switch to just locomotory play and run around a little bit and then jump up against uh, another uh, animal. And that's how we distinguish it by the degree of fragmentation. There is a gray zone. I'm the first one to admit that, particularly when the chickens are getting older, it gets more and more difficult to actually say that this is aggression and this is play. But um, uh, with the help of these criteria, we think that we can be pretty safe that what we record as play behavior is actually play. Uh, thank you so much. But I was wondering if probably you had furthered the aspect of the positive uh, welfare where you, you introduced play for us to be able to see if this actually had implication on the cog in a cog using a cognitive bias test, maybe. Mm -hmm made them to be more optimistic in mm. yeah no we don't have any finished data on that yet but that's one of the things that we want to investigate and this is the, uh, these are experiments we have just started and uh, and uh, we have data that we are analyzing videos that we are analyzing at the moment so hopefully next time next time i see you in nigeria i will be able to show you some results from that We'll be happy to learn more about that. So Kolade Olide said, thank you for this insightful presentation. And it is interesting how much transgenerational effect is observed between hens and chicks in recent time. But could you please shed some light on whether if the cocks are stressed, could this have a similar effect on the offspring, you know, when they mate? So what is the impact of um, from the cock perspective? Uh, and from the, the angle of the cock, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes, we have done quite a bit of research on that uh, actually several years ago. And it it, it seems that the, uh, as a matter of fact, that the effects on the male side can, uh, in, uh, in some respects, be stronger. And we have also looked at some of the mechanisms that might help us explain this. And it seems to be epigenetic. So what uh, we see a, a, a modification of gene expression in the brain that are somehow transmitted through the sperm line to, uh, uh, to the next generation. So we, uh, uh, for some of the, of, of the measures that we have taken, we can see a stronger effect on the male side, actually. Mm, wow. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of, lot of questions coming in. Please let them keep coming in. This, this is an opportunity for us, you know, to understand the basis of how early life stress affects our animals. Uh, there is a question from Daniel Tokide. He said, 
the, the, the hatchery now we, from the process in the hatchery we have realized that it is stressful but can we actually pinpoint which of this you know procedure is actually the one causing the stress or yeah. is it the overall procedure because what you presented is actually the overall picture of what happens mm -hmm. but is it actually the vaccination or you know the, se the separation you know which one is really the main stressful event in this <laughs> Yeah, I wish I could tell you in detail, because that's one of the things that we really wanted to do, but we haven't got around to that yet, is to try to dissect the different parts of the hatchery uh, procedure. Uh, but so far, we have not been able to do that for uh, a number of practical reasons. But what I can tell you, what, what we do have data on is that presumably the incubation part is, is really important. So as a matter of fact, you, uh, there are, we have data that indicate that the incubation is the most stressful part of the whole procedure. Uh, and the, uh, this is, uh, we don't know exactly which aspects of the incubation that might be problematic here, but we need to remember that these incubators are extremely noisy. So the, the chicks are living, uh, developing in an environment where the um, surround, the, the fan noise can reach levels of 90 to 100 decibels, which is pretty much like if you have a jet engine starting just next to you. And they hatch out into this um, very noisy, very stressful environment. Uh, and um, depending on when they hatch, because there is a hatch window of about 24 hours. So that's the time from the first to the last hatch. They are they are just left in the incubator. So some of the chicks actually spend like 24 hours in this very noisy, very crowded first environment. Uh, and it seems like this, the, uh, as you could see from some of the data I showed, we, we do see high high corticosterone levels immediately after the animals have been removed from the uh, from the incubator so yes i i think incubation is really really important and uh, but then i would also love to know more about the next parts of it because there are several aspects in there that might affect the chicks in different ways mm -hmm. So I think there's still a whole lot that needs to be done and a whole lot of uh, research that is yet to be uh, conducted. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a question here for fa from Fami. He's from Indonesia and he has uh, three questions, but they are related. Uh, he's asking that if a live animal, you know, um, observes or watches a video when another chicken is being slaughtered, does this induce something like does this induce something like a trauma in the live animal that have actually seen this and if yes uh how long you know do you think such animal how long do you think this would last for it to you know overcome that's that kind of <laughs> trauma yeah uh, well, uh, th this would be a very speculative answer of course because I don't know of any research in this respect I know there's been there's been some research done 20 years, no, not 20 years, uh, 10 years ago so, um, on, on uh, uh, empathetic reactions in chickens. But that has mainly been uh, uh, mother chickens that react empathetically with stress reactions when they um, perceive that their chicks are being threatened in, in somehow. Um, but that's a transient, uh, quickly overgoing stress reaction. And uh, what... This question is about is whether watching another chicken being killed or slaughtered would be a stressful experience that would last for an extended time. And my answer is simply, I, I really don't know. Uh, no one has really done that research, uh, but I think it's a worthwhile question. It's a worthwhile uh, issue that uh, could be investigated. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, because I think you know, when they watch um, videos of predators, they tend to show the appropriate uh, behavior strategy, maybe trying to hide. So mm -hmm. there's also the possibility that watching an animal, especially when it is not killed in a, in, in a very good way, in a cruel way, that this could have, they may have a, a bad impression about um, 
about it. Yeah, there is also a question here from Novi Masarai. Thank you for amazing talk. I would like to know your opinion about early feeding. I think this has to do with after hatching. Mm -hmm. What is the implication of early feeding? I think. Uh, okay, so this is a bit out of my comfort zone. Uh, I, I, I really don't know, to be quite honest. Um, I All I know is that... Um, uh, as most of you probably know, when chicks are hatched, they um, they hatch with a yolk sac that has been uh, internalized, and that means that they really don't have to eat or drink for maybe 48 hours after hatch, which is basically why we can treat them the way we do and, and transport them uh, and so on. Um, I don't know what the implications would be for early feeding. Um, so I don't think I have a really good answer to that question. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank mm. you. Um, another question from Samuel Duro Sharon. In the first experiment that you described, were the sires or the dams stressed? Um, uh yeah, yeah, yeah. I see the point. The, the one in which we stressed chicks at different ages and uh, and then looked at the, the later consequences and then the offspring. The answer is that both both sexes were, were stressed. And in this case, we did not dis differentiate between maternal and paternal effects. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Tokede wants to know... Um, based on recent research, it has been expressed that certain animals are capable of having an express feeling with regards to their keepers or owners. I think this has to do with human-animal interaction. Mm -hmm. How true is this in relation to the broiler chicken that has been known to be bred only for meat? Can they still exhibit, you know, this close relationship with humans? I think that, it, yes. yeah. I, I see your point here. Now, the thing with, with uh, well, first of all, I, I just want to emphasize that, of course, you can have a close human animal relationship to chickens in general. Uh, every hobby breeder knows that you, you chickens attach to humans and, and uh, can pick up a lot of um, uh, information from humans uh, as well. And we've done some experiments on that as well, actually, to, to, um, uh, to show that particularly um, adult domesticated chickens are particularly good at interacting with humans compared to red jungle fowl, just as you would expect. When it comes to broilers, the things are a bit more tricky, right? Because, well, first of all, broilers are kept in such massive uh, numbers. So it's very difficult uh, to, to get a, a personal relationship to the chickens. Second thing is that they are so young they are uh, slaughtered at an age of uh, about 35 days of age, which means that they are still, even though they weigh two kilos, they are still, uh, they are little babies in their head and they haven't really had the, 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 the time and opportunity to develop social relationships in the proper way. So I'm not sure about the broilers, but um, uh, uh, I think that the main obstacle is the sheer number that we keep the animals in. Uh, maybe if we had, if we would have had smaller, smaller groups um, uh, with a closer relationships between uh, handlers and animals, maybe maybe we would be able to develop more close social relationship. But I think, f at least for what the production system looks like today. Uh, there are no such relationships. These animals are essentially not particularly tame. Well, <laughs> so we actually uh, slaughter them when they are still babies. <laughs> I, I was exactly. surprised. Yeah, I was so surprised to see the slide where you talked about the the lifespan, the the expected mm. lifespan, and I will still have to go back and you know try to figure it out. But I think I have read somewhere that if we are able to, um, you know, try to manage the welfare of the animals, at least for them to to be able to live longer and their production to to extend more than what we have currently, this can serve as uh, a solution to. Um, 
food sustainability that instead of you know year in year out you have to produce billions of animals just within eight weeks if we uh, or let's look at it from the lane beds you know if we can extend their productivity life we don't and they can still continue to lay for a longer time than what we have now then we don't have to you know keep running you know replacement flock um uh, very early and it will also help us to reduce the number of uh, animals that we we, we produce uh, or what yeah, do you think about it? absolutely I mean, from a sustainability perspective, this is a different aspect than the ones that I have been talking about. But from a sustainability aspect, it's it's kind of uh, crazy what we do here, uh, where we um, uh, have these specialized egg layers. And once they are finished with laying eggs, which is essentially when at the point when they are starting their first molt, um, at that time, they could easily continue to produce eggs for many years after that. Instead, we slaughter them and they are regarded as, as garbage uh, because we have the broilers for the meat production. So we don't use the 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 we don't use the dead slaughtered laying hens for anything basically. So it, it, it's a it's a big waste of, of uh, resources. Yeah. Thank you so much for Jensen. Uh, to the participants, uh, we are open for discussion. If you have any points or issue that you think is related to this that you want to raise that maybe has not been raised in the question or even in his presentation, feel free to use the raise up hand button and I will unmute you for you to talk about it. And also, um, yeah, you're also free to turn on your video. Let us see ourselves. Don't forget that one of the mission of the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria is for us to be able to network and, you know, to collaborate with ourselves because at times we have people who complain that they are being the only one in their country, they are isolated, they don't have people to even discuss ideas with. That is also one of the reasons why we appreciate people, you know, getting to know each other on this platform. Uh, so please, if you're comfortable with it, you're free to turn on your video. And if you have further questions and comment, you're free, you know, to indicate that you want to say something. So, uh, Pajensin, I also want to take your, you back to the picture or the video where you showed the growth of uh, the, the red jungle fowl and the broiler chicken over the years due to the genetic selection. And I know this has actually led to a lot of welfare issues, like you reported, but I was actually wondering, in overall, the broilers go very fast. We have a lot of meat from them and things like that. They experience a lot of welfare issues. We, in overall, will you actually say that the red jungle fowl has a, a better quality of life compared to the broiler chickens? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you can actually uh, put it that way uh, because it's going to be totally related to the environment in which they are kept and under the circumstances. And I think to be quite honest that the red jungle fowl that we maintain in our research facilities, they don't have an optimal uh, life because we keep them in captivity under uh, uh, relatively limited conditions and so on. Um, so in under those conditions, uh, I, I, I think that a domesticated chicken, an egg layer, uh, is probably better able to cope with the, uh, with the captivity conditions. When it comes to the broilers, I think the main issue with the broilers is their growth rate, uh, the fact that they grow so fast. And in that case, I think that it, it really doesn't matter what type of environment you offer them because the, the major welfare problems that they are facing are caused by their rapid growth. That causes uh, leg problems, joint problems, uh, cardiovascular problems, uh, circulation risks, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, it doesn't really matter which environment you offer them. So yes, in one sense, uh, of course, uh, jungle fowl have a better way life uh, if they are given the right conditions, the right life conditions. But that goes for any of the species, I think. Okay, yeah. Is there anybody who have a comment or an issue to raise? Because, yeah, um, most times when, because I do research in poultry behavior and welfare, and we tend to describe the, the, the act whereby the birds try to scratch the litter 
uh, looking for maybe feed crumbs or something as foraging behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has really, this normally used to raise issues because at times some people say foraging should be, you know, the plants uh, pecking some plants, uh, sorry, the, the, the chicken pecking some plants, that, that should be foraging behavior. But I've realized that the, the, um, the behavior of scratching, you know, the litter, and trying to pick things is what is really called foraging behavior. So is that, is it correct? Uh, it is wrong. <laughs> it, 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 it's a matter of definition. When I talk about foraging behavior, I include the whole food searching procedure. And in chickens, scratching and pecking is an essential part of the, uh, uh, of the foraging behavior. So uh, I, I definitely include it all in foraging behavior. So it's foraging is, is looking for food, um, uncovering food and ingesting food. It's all together. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so that's my definition. Yeah, that's what yeah. I believe as well. <laughs> that's what I believe. I'm still expecting the participants to indicate, but if nobody's ready, I still have loads of questions that I've noted here. So and I'll keep on uh, until you indicate so I can unmute you. Yeah. Yeah, I want to uh, talk about another behavior which I have observed. It's not really common, but once in a while I've observed it in the Nigerian chickens, the, the indigenous chickens, and it is egg eating, uh, egg eating behavior, egg eating behavior, where maybe immediately after one hen lays and, you know, the, the, the shell is still soft and you see other hens trying, you know, they try to eat, you break the egg and try to suck um, uh, the content. So... What do you think? Is it? Do you think it's genetically related, environmentally related, or what could be the cause of this? Uh, well, the, I would have to guess here, but um, based on my experience, I I, I would guess that it's uh, it's both. Um, and uh, this is typically a behavior where you see in individual animals. So some animals might develop this type of behavior, and. Um, uh, it can, of course, only develop in certain types of environments, and in particular when when they are kept in in crowded environments where they have uh, little opportunity to get away from each other. So the typical behavior of of, of a red jungle fowl and also a free ranging chicken when laying egg is to find a secluded, hidden place for a nest, and that's where they're going to accumulate their their eggs. Uh, which means that they are out of reach from other birds. So when we keep them crowded together, uh, this natural behavior is impossible to the chickens. And of course, the eggs will be exposed to anyone else in the group. And if some individual has this, um, develops this habit of eating other eggs, uh, it would be very easy for them to, to do that in that particular condition. I would expect that there are some nutritional explanations as well, but... Uh, it's all um, uh, an interaction between genetics and, and environment because only some individuals do it and only under some conditions. Mm. Mm. So much. I think we still have four minutes and two questions just dropped in the chat box mm -hmm. uh, from Rachel Dagrande. She's saying, did you test the mirror as a social motivation in adult hands? Have, have you also tried it in adult hands? Do you think this might work the way it worked in the chicks? Ah, but that's a good question. Yes, we have tested that in several experiments, actually. We are running an experiment uh, right at the moment, and I had a, a meeting this morning with one of my students who is doing exactly this. So we have a, a pen where we need to keep uh, chickens for an uh, experiment they need to be on their own during half an hour and we don't want them to be stressed from social isolation so we we put in mirrors in in, in, in this compartment and it has definitely a relaxing attitude and we have also looked at the uh, preference so chickens that can um, show their preference whether they want to be in a pen with mirrors or one with without mirrors and uh, they clearly prefer uh, uh the mirrors so uh yes i'm absolutely sure that they understand that uh, they have this um a, a social stimulation so yes it works okay thank you so much 
Another, a question from Daniel Tukidi from the explanation about slaughtering broilers when they are still young. Is it safe to say that muzzle composition and nutrient composition is not adequate? Okay. Um, I don't think so. Now I am not a I'm not a meat specialist at all, but um, uh, Again, from, from experience, I would say that animals that are allowed to grow and mature have um, uh, more developed muscles, which are uh, at least more tasty, uh, that's for sure. Uh, whether they are more nutritive or not, I don't really know. We have a problem in Europe, at least, with um, the fact that um, uh, uh, producers of chicken meat... Um, uh, inject a lot of water into the muscles uh, to uh, increase the weight. So that's a way of getting some more money out of uh, the already very fast growth of these chicks. And of course, in that case, uh, this is um, makes them less nutritious. Uh, that's that's obvious if if they consist of a large percentage of water. But I I, I wouldn't dare to say anything in a general way for, about this. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I think with that, we have come to the end of the question. Thank you very much, Dr. Yasere. Thank you very much, Professor Pa Jensen. That was very educative. And I want to also appreciate all the participants. Uh, pa Jensen, I need to tell you that some of us uh, fell in love with animal behavior because of you. Oh, thank you. So, <laughs>